After seven days in the center of Paris, we continue on up the Seine River. Turn into the Burgoyne Canal. Stop at Dijon for three days and then continue on into the Saone River. Down the Saone until it is joined by the Rhone River and on south to Avignon. The historic Cathedral of Notre Dame is our final site of Paris as we motor up the Seine on our way over the mountains to southern France. We only logged eight miles the first day after a late start and a long delay at the first locks. We had the boat lifted out of the water because of a strange noise from the stern bearing. A close inspection of the propeller shaft and bearing is made by the local mechanic and skipper but no abnormalities or signs of excessive wear are apparent. We'll just have to live with the noise. We leave the Seine and enter the historic Burgoyne Canal. The fall colors are a real delight. We were surprised to see this pair of Americans at the edge of the lock. At the next locks, we see a couple of natives. She drinks while he stands guard. The lock gates make an interesting playground for the lock keeper's children. After several of these small locks, we develop our technique. Charlie stays with the boat, and I grab the ladder as we go by and climb up and secure the bow and stern lines. It is customary for each boat to supply one person to help the lock keeper, and here I am opening one of the lock gates to let us out after the lock has filled. We are now nearly at the top of the mountains as we round a bend and see the two mile long pulley tunnel entrance. The tunnel is unlighted and just wide enough for a barge. The barges are towed through by an electric powered tug but we go through on our own. It gets darker and darker as we go forward into the tunnel. back, the light recedes behind us. I shine our six cell flashlight on the trolley wires overhead to enable Charlie to stay in the center of the narrow tunnel. Finally, we see light ahead, and 30 minutes after entering the tunnel, we come out the other end. It is all downhill from here to the blue Mediterranean. We've logged 231 miles since leaving Paris and are 300 miles from the Med. This is the high point of our trip in more ways than one. At Dijon, we join up with a Danish couple headed for the Greek islands 
in a converted fishing boat. Their boat is named Heidi. L reverses the procedure used in the up flocks and now gets off at ground level and has to jump aboard as Gypsy Girl shoots out of the locks. She did this 37 times one day. She never missed. The Saon is broad and smooth, so we travel side by side with Heidi when we reach it. As we exit a huge locks on the Saon after several cloudy days, I take advantage of a beautiful sunny day and do the laundry. We are just about to enter the Rhone River and will then be only 250 miles from the Mediterranean where we will step the mast and go sailing. One 35 mile stretch of the Rhone is still dangerous, so we team up with two other boats and hire a pilot to lead us through. There were two boats astern and the pilot was in the boat ahead of us. At times we can almost reach out and touch the exposed rocks as we go roaring along at about 10 knots. We arrive safely, tie up, and pay the pilot. It's been one of the best $25 investments we've ever made. We tie up outside Heidi at Avion. We will relax a couple of days, then leave Voin and Gita on the Heidi and continue down the Rhone River. From Avignon, we will continue down the Rhone River just a few miles, take a lateral canal to set on the Mediterranean, then coastal hop from harbor to harbor around the coast of France and Spain to Cartagena. These are nearly all daylight hops, but occasionally they're so far apart we must get up in the middle of the night to assure a daylight arrival at the next harbor. Sadly part from our Danish traveling companions at Avignon as we continue down the Rhone toward the Med and they stay there another few days. We see our first herd of wild white horses. They are rounded up once a year for human consumption. We see a huge flock of flamingos and just have to stop and admire them. They eventually become uneasy and finally take flight. They are a beautiful sight and we don't leave until the last fly away. first view of the Mediterranean at set and there are very few boats on it this time of year. We wonder why but later find out. The mast is stepped at set. Gypsy Girl becomes a sailboat again. It's been three months and nearly a thousand miles since we started motoring at Amsterdam. L scrubs the deck in spite of the chilly weather and we get rid of the tire fenders. Our 
second day out on the med, we have a good wind and the snow-capped Pyrenees for a backdrop behind the deserted waterfront apartments of the French coast. Soon the wind pipes up and we take six turns in the main as the wind suddenly goes from 10 miles per hour to 35 miles per hour in about five minutes. We became acquainted with Stu and Elaine Vanells on the Apollo 32, which is also built by Kloss Bass in Copenhagen. We decided to travel in tandem with them for the next few days. They usually pass us around midday after a later departure. The unpredictable med was flat calm the first day they passed. This is typical of many of the rough and cold days we spend on the med as we charge along under reduced sail. Room was limited when we arrived at this little harbor, so we tied outside the Apollo 32. It is now December 24th, and we get our Christmas present early as the wind freshens and allows us to sit idly by as Maestro does his stuff. It's an offshore breeze with a moderate sea, and we hardly touch the tiller all day. The mid can be beautiful. After relaxing in Cartagena for a couple of days, we continue on down the southern Spanish coast to Gibraltar, again going by easy daylight hops, except when the harbors are so far apart that we have to depart in the middle of the night to arrive at the next harbor in the daylight. We are all secure in Cartagena Harbor by sundown on Christmas Eve, and L lights three Christmas candles that our grandchildren have sent us. The next day, we had Christmas dinner aboard in the fishing harbor. There had been no room at the inn. Oops, I mean at the Club Nautico. We looked across a placid harbor as Christmas Day faded away. The first two hours out of Cartagena are under power, but at 10 o'clock the wind picks up and we are soon close hauled into a 20 mile per hour headwind. December 31st, we round the breakwater at Malaga and tie up near two U.S. Navy transports. We spent a quiet New Year's Eve aboard, and the only noise at midnight was three weak blasts by one of the Navy ships. Several days later, we see Gibraltar under the mainsail. We've traveled over 750 miles in the Mediterranean and we're going to be happy to leave it. It's cold and capricious in December. As you can see, we are again well reefed down as we approach Gibraltar. The rain catchment on Gibraltar shows up as we approach. Spain has cut off their water and they have to import or catch it from the infrequent rains. 
the British believe that if the monkeys leave Gibraltar, so will they. A British Army sergeant has been responsible to see that this does not happen and has been their caretaker for many years. There is a good view of the Straits of Gibraltar from the top of the rock. The shipyards and apartments take up most of the room on the rock. From Gibraltar, we go almost due west for 100 miles and then southwest to the Canary Islands. The rock is still British, but all direct communication and transportation with Spain has been cut off. People living in Spain but working on the rock must commute via Morocco to get the five miles from Algeciras to Gibraltar. I practice with the plastic sextant and discover that Gibraltar is right where it is supposed to be, plus or minus five miles or so. That should get us within sight of land. We are finally on our way, just 800 miles to our next landfall after we clear the Straits of Gibraltar. We stay close to the shore on the Spanish side of the Straits because of a strong opposing current in the center of the Straits. This is almost constant because of evaporation in the med. On the second day out, we see something in the water just off our course and divert to investigate. It is a fishing float a little net and line, all covered with barnacles. It's been at sea for some time. On the eighth day, we have another beautiful sunset at sea. Nine days, 800 miles, and there is Gran Canaria right where and when it should be. Every landfall is a thrill after several days at sea. We get our strongest wind of the passage as we beat into the harbor at Las Palmas under threatening skies. This Norwegian ferry is owned by two Canadian boys and they are trying to get passengers for the trip to Barbados. They plan to motor two days and drift and sail every third day for 2,700 miles. Two hours out of Las Palmas and we get hit by a squall. It looked like more of the same, so L suits up and puts on a safety harness. We always wear them in bad weather and at night. Our next harbor is Puerto Rico on Gran Canaria. Finally, we see this three-masted schooner just leaving a harbor, and there it is. This little tourist area is named Puerto Rico and is a favorite winter vacation spot for Scandinavians, a few English, and even fewer strays from other countries. It has a much sunnier climate than Las Palmas, just 35 miles away, and many tourists drive down for a day of sun and swimming.
After several days at Puerto Rico and a change of crew, we're ready for the crossing to the West Indies. We leave Gran Canaria and head southwest to just above the Cape Verdes Islands and then across the 17th parallel to Antigua. Unfortunately, Eleanor had to fly to the U.S. for serious medical attention. Before she left, we interviewed several potential crew members, and it was Eleanor's considered opinion that Christina was clearly the most appropriate to replace her. I agreed, and Eleanor departed with great regret, and Christina moved aboard. Christina spends the first four hours on the tiller so she can get the feel of Gypsy Girl. Also, it gives Charlie a chance to evaluate her capabilities. In addition to a sail, float, and tentacles, the man of war has a self-riding mechanism. However, unlike a sailboat, it is not ballast placed as low as possible but a weighted tail that can be moved from side to side to the other. There, he made it. On day nine, the wind swings more to the north and becomes squally. It goes from 15 miles per hour to 35 miles per hour in a few minutes. We tire of changing sails and finally settle for the working jib and a reefed main. We lose a little distance, but it's easier. We logged 120 miles this day. At dawn on day 10, we are still reefed and there is a squall line astern and headed in our direction. It passes us a couple of hours later and we get a little sprinkle, but no real rain. Maestro, the wind vane, is working great. However, with squalls around, the seas are confused and Maestro gets the same way occasionally. So someone has to be ready to assist him if two freak waves in a row throw him off course. Finally, on day 11, we catch a mai mai. These fish are also called Dorado or dolphin. They are a beautiful fish, fun to catch and delicious to eat. Two days later, we catch a nice yellowfin tuna. We use a 50 pound test line and 40 pound test leader. So if it's this size, we just reel him in. If we, we have to luff up if he's much larger than this in order to bring him aboard. We had company on day 14. These five flying fish flew aboard, but found the cockpit seat too short for takeoff, so decided to stay for breakfast. They sure were tasty. Flying fish come aboard mostly at night and sometimes do a kamikaze dive on the helmsman. The storm gym has been fitted with slides and put as high up the mast as possible to act as a steadying sail. It reduces the rolling about 50%. After a shower, we caught this fine Mai Mai, and he came off the hook as I lifted him over the side. When a big fish like this is caught, enough is put aside for dinner, breakfast, and lunch. Charlie likes fish. The rest is sprinkled with various seasonings or just salted and then hung up to dry. Thank you. 
There are no flies or other land insects offshore, so the meat is quite sanitary, and the sun, wind, and salt air do a nice job of preserving it. I strongly encourage everyone that crews for me to learn navigation. It serves as a check on my own and would be useful in an emergency. Christina has been studying and practicing since shortly after our departure from the canal. We're now approaching land and she's getting anxious. I was able to get a fix every day in spite of the squally weather. Radio signals can also be used as a check for the last several hundred miles. The morning of the 28th day is overcast with limited visibility, but we have seen the light on Guadalupe, an island just south of Antigua. So by first light, we are straining our eyes, and suddenly there it is, right where and when it was expected. Christine is happy about it. Twenty-eight days, twenty-eight hundred miles in a twenty-eight foot boat has provided time and place for a nice crop of gooseneck barnacles to grow. They are a common sight on ocean crossing sailboats. Christina has friends in Antigua and departs a few hours after we arrive. It's been a great experience for both of us, in spite of the poor weather. Christina was as good a crew as any skipper could desire. She stood her watches, did all the cooking, and always had a ready smile. Music by Elaine Jardine. Mm -hmm. 